All right, welcome to the Pangburn Philosophy Podcast. This is Travis Pangburn. Today I'm speaking with Brian Green. He is world renowned for his groundbreaking discoveries in the field of superstring theory, including the co-discovery of mere symmetry and the, t- and the discovery of spatial topology change. He is the director of Columbia's Center for Theoretical Physics. Brian is also an actor. He has written and performed several original theater pieces, had his own miniseries, The Fabric of the Cosmos, appeared in Hollywood films. Basically, he's done it all. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, Brian. Oh, it's my pleasure. Awesome. So let's just start off with what's new in the world of Brian Green. Oh, well, I'm actually finishing up a new book at the moment. I can't say a whole lot about it, but... uh... As you might guess, it takes on some pretty big questions and tries to see whether the perspective of physics can give us some new insight. And what uh, what's kind of do you focus on a certain area of physics? Well, there you go. You're trying to get me to talk, <laughs> <laughs> which is good. But, uh, but the book basically um, is kind of taking a look at um, the universe from. Uh, not just the beginning, but also into the far future and trying to get a sense of what our understanding of physics can do to our sense of who we are and how we fit in. So it's not only the hardcore cutting edge ideas of cosmology and quantum mechanics, all of that has to play a role in the book of that sort, but it also takes a look at, you know, what gives our lives meaning within the rigorous context of science. Mm. Interesting. Well, I won't bug you too much about that because uh, I'm sure you want to save it. Um, So uh, on September 5th, coming up here, you'll share the stage with neuroscientist and author Sam Harris. What are some topics you'd like to touch uh, with Sam? And I I believe this will be your guys' first discussion. Well, it's actually our first public discussion. Right. It's our second discussion ever. We had dinner together. My God, it must have been... um, 15, 20 years ago, I think we both were publishing books at that time with Norton and we shared an editor um, and she brought us together for dinner. And it was a it was a great meeting, but it's so long ago. But basically, I think, as you know, I'm more or less happy to talk about any of these these subjects that touch on these these big questions. I know Sam is interested in things like uh, free will, role of religion questions of that nature. And uh, while I can't claim any particular expertise in those areas, I'm game to talk about them. Yeah, they're fun to talk about. What, uh, just for interest's sake, what is your take on free will? Do we have any or are we absent? Well, in the end, as who knows, maybe we will talk about in the onstage discussion, it depends in large part on exactly how you define free will. You know, these issues often come down to the nuance of what the words truly mean. But if you use the most flat-footed, straightforward, intuitive interpretation that we humans can kind of step in and direct how things go in a manner that is not ironclad held by physical law, I don't think that is possible. In the end of the day, physics does govern everything. And we are part of everything. So that doesn't mean that we don't have some kind of autonomy, but it's not the one that I think most of us imagine when we choose vanilla over chocolate or we choose to go left over right. We kind of feel that we are the ones in which that decision is originating and it doesn't have any precursor. There's nothing pulling our strings. And from that perspective, I think that thinking is wrong. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I, th- I I find most people I talk to agree with you on that. Um, I, d- I do find it interesting when we get the Dan Dennett's of the world that uh, that uh, tend to disagree and they come at it from a different perspective. But um, I think it's a it's a fun conversation, even for anyone. Yeah, I think it's a fun dinner table conversation, to be honest. <laughs> well, yeah, I think many of the best conversations are ones that can be hit from a variety of different angles, from the person who's just going to be willing to give it some serious thought, 
to those who actually do this kind of thing for a living. So those questions are the ones that really matter to us. Right. Um, Sam, always he's always interested, like when I have dinner with him or at, we grab a drink after an event, we, we always get on the subject of psychedelics. Have you uh, talked on that much? <laughs> I myself have not spent a lot of time talking about that. We did an interesting um, program. You know, in New York, we run this event called the World Science Festival. Right. And we did an event with Oliver Sacks ah. uh, years ago when, when he just came out with his book. I think it was called Hallucinations or Hallucinations, something like that. I uh, hope I'm getting the title right. And um, he very forthrightly described his own personal experiences in that, which were um, fascinating to hear, not only because they're wild, but because since he was coming at it from a, a neuroscientific perspective, he was constantly analyzing his own psychedelic experiences, sort of a running commentary about what was going on inside of his brain when he was picturing those purple little 12 legged dancers jumping around in the stars, you know, so, right. um, so, so that, you know, it's quite fascinating, but I don't, I don't have much personal experience in this domain. Right. It seems kind of like a, a thing that most neuroscientists just have to do to see what it's like. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, if you're going to spend your life thinking about the brain, yeah. how fascinating to have the brain act in unfamiliar ways. Right. And uh, one of the simplest ways of doing that is to inject some new chemical species that the brain has to deal with. So, yeah, totally fascinating for everybody, really. Right. Well, I'm really looking forward uh, to the event, and so are all the people in Toronto. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, on November 1st in New York City, you will sit down with Richard Dawkins, and you've spoken with him before. Um, he, yeah. he has had such a huge impact on the world scientifically and educationally. Um, what what do you think about the way Richard has gone about addressing religious dogma in the world? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, and one that, you know, I, I did speak with Richard about it in a public setting once. He had just come out with his book, uh, his first, uh, the first volume of his memoir. Uh, I think it was called An Appetite for Wonder. And we sat down at the 92nd Street Y, and, and we did talk about that to some extent. And um, it was interesting because when I have been at his lectures, his public lectures, perhaps they were early, and that may be the origin of what I'm about to say. But in those days, it really felt so strident. His position felt so intransigent. It felt so... Uh, unwilling to give uh, religion any value whatsoever. And it struck me that, A, I, I don't feel that way, personally, but B, it also struck me as a strategically wrong way of going about it, because if your goal is to transform people's thinking, you have to meet people where they are. And if you're going to take that perspective the only ones who are at that place are the ones who are already convinced of your position. So it was very hard for me to imagine there being a widespread open arm embrace of the message that Richard was getting across from those who are the very people that he wants to reach. You would think those who are religious. Now, of course, he has examples and will give, you know, anecdotes of, of, of people that were religious that, heard him or read him and, and, and radically changed. And of course, there are, I'm sure there are examples of that sort. But as a strategic approach, it doesn't strike me as wise. And the interesting thing was at that event, and perhaps in many others, I haven't been following his public appearances in great detail, but he didn't feel to me as strident. He felt much more willing to um, take a stance that wouldn't make a religious person feel like he was looking at them like they were dumb. Right. And to me, that's a... That's a much better way of going about it. Well, I think the long form discussion really helps. Uh, when when Richard uh, was, he would get on TV, and you got your <laughs> whatever your fifteen second window or whatever to to get uh, you know, and the questions seem to always be charged to try to get that soundbite out of people. Like 
Richard, it, it makes it difficult to understand the man's perspective, I think. Uh, yeah. and, the, and I think the long form discussion, which is now becoming popularized for good reason, I think it, it's, this is, uh, this is really helping people to get a better understanding of what people's positions actually are, as opposed to just seeing the, perhaps the emotional side of the argument. Yeah, well, I can well imagine what you're saying is true. I mean, I've been in that position myself where unless charged issues like unified theories or string theory, <laughs> you, know, you get on some program and, and they don't want the nuance of the fact that these are untested ideas. They're exciting. They're mathematically consistent and compelling, but they've yet to be tested. No, they just want Einstein has been unseated. And you're like, oh, my God. You know, that's not yeah. what I'm saying. That's yeah. not right. <laughs> and and so, so I have great sympathy for being placed in a position where a media outlet is looking for the quick hit in order to up their viewership uh, at the particular program or their views on YouTube. And it's and it's quite irritating and difficult to be nuanced in those situations, all the more so I'd imagine in a subject that is as charged as religious belief. Right. Um, okay, let's jump to super string uh, for a minute. Um, <laughs> I don't know how quickly we can do this, but do you have? Here we a, go, right? <laughs> <laughs> do you have a uh, like? Uh, well, what's what's the difference between string theory and and super string theory? And are are these still you know uh, worthwhile pursuits? Um, and yeah. you know, people. Uh, I know I've spoken with Lawrence Krauss at times about string theory, and he's and he has a pretty negative reaction to anyone that brings up string theory. And I just, uh, where's where is string theory at, and what are the differences there? Yeah, well, I think there's two things that that come into this. Let me stick to the science first, and if I remember, maybe I'll come back to the uh, the other side of things. But uh, scientifically, uh, to your first question. There isn't really a, a major distinction between string theory and super string theory. The super itself refers to something called supersymmetry, which is a, a quality of the fundamental equations that allows them to be more mathematically behaved than without that quality. So when we say string theory, we're typically always referring to super string theory. Uh, in terms of your second question, whether these theories are still worthy of being pursued, the answer to my mind, the first thought is, what do you mean still? Uh, we have been continuously pursuing these since really the late 1960s, if we go all the way back there. And all the way through, the theories have amazed us. They have come forward with mathematical qualities that tie together the fundamental laws of physics that suggest extraordinarily strange properties of reality that are able to embrace many of the pivotal discoveries of the past in previous theories. So it's not like we have to throw away the past. We're able to embrace all the discoveries of the past in a framework that goes further. Now, the, the issue, of course, which is where your question comes from, is the theory has yet to be experimentally confirmed or tested. And this is a huge issue. It's one that we don't hide from. You know, if you look at any of my books or any of my colleagues' books or papers, or you come to any of our conferences, we're all out in front about this being the fundamental piece of the puzzle that we're missing. But the idea, of course, is when you're dealing with a theory that's as fundamental and deep as string theory, a theory that can put together gravity and quantum mechanics, general relativity, our fundamental understanding of space-time curvature with quantum theory, our understanding of the microscopic realm. And it can do that in a way that seems to have the potential to embrace real physics. You're motivated to go forward. So we are going forward. And who knows how long it will take until we understand the theory well enough to say, OK, do this test. Look for this. And if you find it, this is evidence in support of the theory. But if you don't find it, it rules the theory out. We would love to be able to do that today. We just haven't gotten to the stage where we can. And, and so, so, you know, in terms of is it, is it worth going forward? Ultimately, whatever a scientist does is personal choice. And you have to make a decision. What do you consider worthy of your time and attention? If you go around once in life, where should you be putting your effort? And a theory such as this is sufficiently appealing to many people who are continuing to pursue it. 
I don't go out there and proselytize. I don't try to get scientists to work on the theory. You work on it if it strikes you as a worthwhile pursuit. Right. Um, and if the theory is confirmed, then what? Well, if the theory is confirmed, this would open a new chapter of discovery because we would finally have on the table consistent laws. We don't have that right now. We have laws that work when things are big. That's where gravity matters, stars, galaxies, black holes, and certain domains. We have a theory that works when things are small, quantum mechanics, particles, molecules, atoms, things of that sort. But we don't have a theory, except for string theory, that puts those two theories together in a consistent manner. So you really can say without hyperbole that the framework within which we have been investigating the universe over the past, whatever, 30, 40, 50 years is fundamentally incoherent. The equations don't work together. Now, for the most part, that hasn't gotten in people's way because they have focused only on the big or only on the small. But we've long since known that there are domains where you need to be both big and small, like the moment of the Big Bang, where the entirety of the universe is crushed to a small size, or black holes, where again, matter is crushed into extremely dense nuggets. And in those domains, if you don't have a theory that can put gravity and quantum mechanics together, you're lost. You don't know what you're doing. And that's where we hope these theories, if they are confirmed, will one day shed the deepest light. Perhaps we'll really understand, for instance, how the universe began. Very cool. Yeah, I hope I'm alive for that. <laughs> um, Me too. Me too. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about... Uh, so here's my question. Is it a waste of resources for humanity to fund efforts to populate other planets, or is, or is this a realistic pursuit? And something we should be spending time on. Well, I think it's, uh, I'm sorry. yeah, I, I guess my view is it's really a question of apportioning resources in a sensible manner. And if you were to say that we were doing that the, at the expense of all research and all sciences, of course, I would say that's not the right way to use our, our funding. But for us to be thinking about this now, I think is a good thing. We recognize that there's going to come a point in the far future when we have to leave this planet and maybe sooner than we think, hopefully not. But we are at heart explorers. That's who we have always been. And the next frontier, the next terrain certainly is leaving this planet and going elsewhere. So I don't think it's too early to think about these things. I don't think it's too early to even have our first forays, to have groups of individuals try to set up communities on other worlds. I think that is the kind of exploration that would get the public incredibly excited. I think it's the kind of exploration that reignites a passion and an interest for science. And um, one just has to be judicious in how much money is spent because from a purely scientific perspective, having robotics go out into space and do the exploration for us is cheaper, it's more efficient, it's more effective, it's much safer. So you have to do things in a balanced way. And I think ultimately that's what good policy is about. Right. Um, let's talk about your history a bit. Um, how did you get into acting and, and theater? Was, it, was this through science or did it go the other way? Do, do, were, do, well, while you were growing up, did you do theater and, and film? Yeah, so I would quickly just uh, shade the question a little bit in that uh, the only the only person I ever play is myself. So I'm not right. sure if it's really a thing, you know. Um, you know, I like to take the ideas of science and dramatize them when appropriate, when effective, because I feel that as a scientist, science is not just something I think about cognitively, it's something that really matters to me emotionally. And if you can find a way of communicating these ideas where an audience can feel that drama and excitement, I think it can have great impact. So over the years, especially working with the, the, the science festival, World Science Festival that I mentioned, 
we've developed a, a variety of stage pieces that have aimed to do that and based upon audience response uh, have been pretty successful at getting people to think about science not just as facts that wind up in a textbook but rather as a, a human discovery where we have been expending our life energy to try to figure out this universe and try to figure out how we fit in and I think drama and the ability to tell stories of science while communicating the ideas of science, that combination, I think, is quite powerful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, the inspirational power of science. I mean, the, the Penguin philosophy is let art and science inspire. I believe that having art and science as your fundamental source of inspiration is key to living a fruitful life. And um, yeah, yeah. I just like what, what you guys are doing with the science festival and, and having pieces that inspire people artistically or at least open them up to how science can be inspirational. Uh, I think that is sometimes missed when people say, oh, so what does is, what is science have to say about love or what does science have to say about, you know, the X emotion? I think uh, a c combining art and science, it really it really shows people how how science can be inspirational. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, um, to, to my mind, I think, obviously to yours and to many others too, ultimately we're all on some journey, if I can use grandiose language, to find truth. And truth comes in many flavors. There's a flavor that comes in the form of mathematics that allows you to make calculations and predict the magnetic dipole moment of the electron to 10 decimal places that's one kind of truth but there are other kinds of truth that speak to more human qualities and art is very good at stimulating that kind of journey and and giving us a sense of where that journey can lead and when science and art can illuminate each other Wow, that's a powerful combination. Yeah, I think where the confusion happens, and I think where this this idea of truth gets dangerous, is when um, people are not willing to accept scientific findings or scientific truth. I actually think anti-science is the biggest ideological threat to humanity. Um, you know, things like climate change denial, believing that the earth is 6,000 sure. years old, full, full denial of evolutionary theory. Is, is anti-science something that um, worries you? It does worry me. And the way in which uh, society has progressed where, uh, you know, everybody has a voice now in, in the social world and social media. And the, there's something quite wonderful about that. Because now everybody can speak, and in principle, everybody has an opportunity to be heard. At the same time, one has to recognize that there are facts, there are experts, there are people who know things because they've spent a lifetime studying them and experimenting and observing and figuring things out. And there are people, therefore, that really know more than you do on any given subject. And that's true for me. It's true for everybody. So to somehow have this sense that all opinions are equal is just ludicrous. Some opinions are not equal because they're not informed by this depth of understanding. And that can be, as you say, extraordinarily dangerous. So my view on the different flavors of truth is one has to be diligent in applying the right sort of truth to the kind of question that we are asking. And if we're asking questions about climate change, the truth there will come from the climate scientists. It will come from the data. It will come from the observations. It will come from the trend lines and the curves. That is the relevant data. That's the relevant truth for that kind of a question. Obviously, you wouldn't turn to a climate scientist if you're looking for truth about the questions that you asked of, of love or meaning or purpose, right? right? That takes you in a different direction. So, so it's really just a matter of keeping the categories straight. Yeah. Well, and I, I, think, I think we really need to focus on trying to get um, world leaders in power that value scientific truth. Um, yeah. I feel like, 
you know, with what's happened with Trump, I mean, it seems like everything coming from that office right now really is on the on the verge of promoting anti-science, um, a, a lot of things at least. And it's... I, I think this, uh, with, with what I believe thinking, I think thinking is becoming popular and I, and I hope, I hope that's going to have a trickle up effect, uh, to politicians to see that, well, maybe our platforms should be based on, you know, skepticism and science and, and well thought out, critically thought out, uh, platforms and, and the, the having this can get me votes. Um, do you think that this is possible or are we going to be playing this political game of just playing to each other's parties forever? Well, yes, I do think it's possible. You know, I think we're in an absolutely um, absurd time at the moment. You know, when you have a leader whose only barometer of success is that of his own winning at all costs is all that matters well then all bets are off in terms of rational decision making and sensible thought and and considered policy so it's just impossible it's not even worth thinking about how we could make the progress you're talking about in the context that we're currently in but i'd like to think that uh, this will pass <laughs> And when it passes, then I think we have a shot at achieving exactly what you're talking about. We just need to have leaders who recognize the value of careful, considered thought in trying to shape a future as opposed to the distraction solely of their own political fortunes, which is unfortunately where a great deal of our political energy goes. Right. Um, well, let's finish up with this question. Uh, if, if I'm an investor with, say, $50 million, where should I be? If I, if I had to invest my money into kind of one area of science, uh, what area could use that most right now, in your opinion? You know, obviously, it's a difficult question because it all depends on on where you want to have impact. And if fifty million dollars were to come at me, there are things that I would love to do with that. There are telescopes to be built. Uh, unfortunately, it's not enough money for the next collider, but it might be seed money to generate money for the next collider. So there are big questions about the, the origins of matter, the origins of the universe, that we would love to have more powerful tools to investigate. So maybe if your 50 million turned into 50 billion, uh, we would have the kind of impact. Uh, but of course, there, there are other vital and wonderful areas of study, right? I mean, if I wasn't doing physics, I think I would be doing what, what Sam Harris does. I would be doing neuroscience. I think the brain is this incredible new frontier where the next 50 years is going to be breathtaking as we begin to truly understand the microphysical workings of the brain, begin perhaps to mimic those workings in, in artificial environments, and begin to manipulate the way in which biology has long since ruled completely over brain function. So taking 50 million or 50 billion, if you don't mind me upping a little bit, and yes. injecting that into, into neuroscientific research, I think, I think that could have spectacular ramifications for the way we live. But the third thing, and I could keep on going forever on this, is we have to make sure that we're going to live. We have to make sure that we're going to be here. And injecting money into climate change and climate science and alternative energy sources and being able to truly educate the public on where we're at and the critical place that we are, are, are currently uh, in our evolution of life on this planet, uh, I think money would be quite well spent in ensuring that we have a future. So, you know, again, uh, it all depends on where you're coming from, but there are uh, spectacularly exciting places in which funding can have a profound impact. 
Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I really look forward to meeting you um, on September 5th when we go for dinner. It'll be a lot of fun. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that as well. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Let art and science inspire.